Mrs. Carnegie, your involvement today with us has come to an end. I'll be confiscating the remainder of your assets and transferring them to Mrs. Breedlove. Thank you, Miss Lena. Where would we be without you to keep things square between us? Mr. Davison, you have the floor. How? How did it come to this? Mr. Davison, you and I both knew before we began that one way or another, only one of us was going to come out on top. That's how it works. That's how it always works. I know, I just don't understand. When Gambino over there was in the picture, my revenue streams were solid. And now my cash flows have dried up with the loss of Carnegie. I don't know what to do. Um, um. Out of options? I couldn't agree more. Because the way I see it, Davison, this is the end of the line. No. No, there's always a way out. Perhaps. But do you see what I see? I think you do. I can see it in your eyes. Because once you do what you know you must, you'll see what I already know. It's all mine. We'll see about this. So the games that people play, some of us take our games very, very seriously. Some of us just laugh off and have a good time. I've told you before, I don't really enjoy playing games with my wife because she has a snack of always winning and thoroughly enjoying it when she wins, which makes it not so much fun. But you know, you have those people always win, some of us just have fun, and the games are on there. But sometimes the games we play are not just those board games, sometimes the games are different. We play games with God sometimes. Even though God gives us the rules, he gives us the guidelines, he gives us the warnings, we play games with our faith and think, oh, if I just have a little bit of God, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, so I can twist my own rules and think somehow I can have the whole world and still have all of heaven and we're playing a terrible gamble game. There's also games we play with people. You know how those people games go? We, we begin when we're children and we, we perfect a little bit as we're teenagers and saying, how do I become the most popular? How do I get ahead? How do I connect with pers this person to get ahead of you? And we keep a, t continuing that even into adulthood and even seniors play people games where I'm more important than you and sometimes to get ahead, I will knock you down to win this game, whatever it is that we're setting up our own terms. It's just really weird how we do that. But have you seen it, haven't you? We play games with the world and we play games with integrity and think, I gotta get ahead at my schooling, I gotta get ahead at my work and I'm gonna win this game and I'm gonna get that promotion, I'm gonna make the most money, I'm gonna get the most achieving and sometimes we will gamble our integrity away to make sure we win this game of our careers and our jobs and money and it's weird how we do this. We play games with so many situations that are not exactly honorable. And each week, we're going to take a different game. So the game today is the game of operation. And the game of operation is kind of fun, but we'll just kind of pull some things out of him. Ha ha. But we're going to pull some things out, and we'll do some scripture, and just kind of look at some stuff. Now, a little bit of history on the game of operation. It was invented by a na man named Joe Spinelli back in 1964. And so Joe Spinelli had this idea that he had took, some, uh, took an idea of an operating table, the body, and wired up some wires with this little buzzer and you try to remove the parts from him. So you get these game cards. Oh, they're in my pocket. Here you go. Get these game cards, and you, whatever the game card says, that's what you remove. This one says Adam's apple. So you, it's your turn. You take the little tweezers, and you go at it to try to remove the Adam's apple. And you do it successfully. You get it out without touching the sides like that. 
Aren't you impressed? Oh, I dropped his apple. But if you do it wrong, you touch the side and the buzzer goes off and he lights up his nose and it's kind of weird that he's looking at you the whole time during his surgery, but he's there. All right, so that's what happens when you're not supposed to do it right. But if you successfully do it, then you make lots of money. We all like to make lots of money, don't we? So the game is fun. But he has this game set up. It's interesting that he sold the game to a little company for $500. He didn't get any royalties because he thought it's just a game. And he was so thrilled to get $500. And he said, can I have a job too? And they gave him a job. Well, that company sold out to Milton Bradley. Milton Bradley sold out to Hasbro. And this little game that he sold for $500 came to eventually has brought in over $40 million dollars. Again, no royalties. What a mistake. Especially because in 2014, Joe Spinelli needed surgery himself. Interesting, he invents this game. He needed surgery and he didn't have enough money to have his own operation. And the word got out, it went viral, and people started donating money and he got his surgery that he needed. But we have these games we play. We love the idea that someone could just take the problems out of my life and wouldn't it be good if that could be as simple as it was? Sometimes in the, we play games, we have these losing strategies. A losing strategy, I think, of, I think of Cavity Sam here. If I had these problems in my life, sometimes I become the doctor and I think, I'm just gonna pick out all of your problems and your flaws. So we assume this role of, of the surgeon and we go around and we point out your issues and you have this problem and you have this problem in your life. We'll say, oh, you got one of the problems that Cavity Sam has? You got butterflies in your stomach? I'll say, oh, well, come on, just buck up. Just get over it. Don't worry about those. Maybe you got the brain freeze. You don't know for sure which direction to go. And you said, let me teach you because I obviously know more than you. Or you've got other issues. You've got issues with your funny bone, as he would have. You say, you just need a better sense of humor. But we're quick and easy to give advice. You ever find yourself in that role? We can give advice, we can assess your problems, we can fix all your issues that you've got there. We become the self-appointed teacher. Jesus kind of spoke to that attitude. He was talking to some people and sometimes Jesus told stories by using exaggeration and it's a way of doing humor that people would laugh at his stories but then he would drive home the point. And he gave the illustration, he said, sometimes when you see people, they got this speck in their eye, they got a little thing and you're looking at them going, you, you got a flaw and you can I, let, let me fix that flaw. You ever see someone with something in their face and you just want to pick it off of them? And he says, you see that speck in their eye and you think, if I could just fix this problem for you. And he says, when all the time you have this log sticking out of your own eye, this huge plank, this huge tube of is coming out of your eye and you're more worried about the, the little speck in his eye than the log in your own eye. In Matthew 7, verse 5, he says this, Jesus says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So before we take on that quick role to be the surgeon and pick out your problems, I need to stop and recognize my own. Now the other losing strategy is we actually take the role of, of Cavity Sam and we've got all these issues and problems and we just wanna kinda of cover them up. We just wanna pretend that don't really exist. So I got this Charlie horse that's really getting me down. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna push ahead. It's not gonna stop me. I'm gonna be just fine with it. And I've got this wishbone. I just really wish I could have this and this and this. And we disguise it in a very noble way, but we push ahead to get all those things we want sometimes, pushing out others. And we get this broken heart. We've just been hurt so bad. And we think, I can fix this. If I just find the right person, and if I just fall in love, then my broken heart's gonna be fixed. And we think if I can do all this stuff, we buy all these self-help books thinking I can fix myself. We think we're gonna fix ourselves. It's a losing strategy. We are not going to get ahead. There is a winning strategy. We got these problems in our life. We need the right surgeon. And the right surgeon is Jesus. The winning strategy is we turn to God and we ask God to transform our lives. And I hope that you understand that today. That we ask God, I need your help in my life. We need some things removed from our life. We got some flaws and God is the one to do it. So today we're gonna look at the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a book in the Old Testament. Ezekiel is a prophet. And when the prophet came, he was speaking to the people of Judah, the people of God. And they had fallen from God in so many ways. They had turned away. They had taken on idolatry. They were worshiping so many other things. They had gone the wrong direction. And God sent Ezekiel to come to them and speak to them. And he prophesied. 
And the prophecies are laid out, and they were warned repeatedly, turn back towards God, turn away from your sin, the direction you're going is wrong, and turn back. If you turn back towards God, you'll be restored, but they would not listen to God. They kept going on their direction. As a result, they were carried off into captivity to the country of Babylon, where they became slaves, and they were there for a long, long, long time. And then Ezekiel comes, and he gives them another prophecy, another word from God. So in Ezekiel 36, we see some verses here. And in these verses, he has some promises. Over and over, God says, I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this. And so we can see the promises of God. So I want you to hear the promises of God that he gave through Ezekiel to the people of God at this time. And listen to these promises and how they affect us today. So there in Ezekiel, verse verse 24, we read this one. It says, for I will, this is God speaking, For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries, and you bring you back into your land. Now this prophecy is unique. It's the word of God. Remember, they were in Babylon. And he says, I'm gonna take you out of that nation, and I'm gonna bring you back to where you belong, back to the country, back to the land that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, all those things. I'm gonna bring you back to this land where you belong. And he did that. So the fulfillment of this is he brought them from Babylon, restored them back to the land they were from. But many times prophecies have an immediate fulfillment and then there's a secondary fulfillment. And this is one of those that's really great to see because it's so obvious. So words here, I will take you out of the nations. Well, actually he brought them out of one nation, Babylon. He says, I will gather you from all the countries. The immediate fulfillment was just from Babylon back to the land. Along in 1948, we see the beginning of this secondary fulfillment. When this new country is born in the, in the land, in the world, it becomes the country of Israel, and the Jews are restored to the land. Interesting, back in 1917, there were 59,000 Jews that lived in that land of Palestine. And today, in January of 2020, another census was done, and there's 6,697,000 Jews living in the land. So we've seen the fulfillment of the secondary promise, that God has brought them out of the nations, he's gathered them from all the countries of the world, and he's putting them back. God's word is true, and he fulfills his promises, amen? And he's doing that. Now what I wanna do is continue through here, we're gonna look at some more promises of God, but we'll use, you'll use Cavity Sam over here. One of the things, if you pull this card and you pull it on there, one of the ones that you would get is a brain freeze. So he's got a brain freeze. I think of the brain freeze. You know, you know what that is. You eat ice cream too quick or it gets that cold thing in your head. But I also think of the brain freeze is when you just get stuck. You just kind of get stuck on something. You get obsessed over it. You can't get beyond it. Or, and then sometimes you get full of anxiety over it. You get depressed. And you just don't know where to, where to go, what decision to make. And that brain freeze can be debilitating. And sometimes we just want to become that self-appointed person to fix our own issues, our own problems. But listen to his promise in verse 25. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. So get a place where we're just stuck and don't want to do what we do. We turn to God and he says, I will give you a new start. I'm going to give you this fresh new start, and he's going to do it by cleaning us, by cleaning us up, and he does it with his forgiveness and with his grace, and when we have those injuries in our life to our soul, we need to go to God and say, would you fix this? Would you give me the fresh start? Would you clean what's in me? And we know he does that by the blood of Christ. We just had communion together, and the communion is time we remember the price that was paid so we could be clean of our sins. You ever go to the doctor, and they have to clean out your wound? how painful that is, and it's been several years ago, we were uh, doing some work around the house, and I liked, I liked to do work, I liked to stretch myself and try different things, and there were some big limbs on the tree I needed to cut, and I, something great about using a chainsaw, do you like to use the chainsaws? They're just fun, and so I got the chainsaw out, and Jean said, you be careful, and I go, I'll be fine, she was, be careful, and I'm fine, and she was getting ready to leave, and she goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm gonna cut these big limbs off this tree, and I got the extension ladder out, and she goes, I'm not gonna leave until you get done. I go, just fine, just go ahead and leave. And she goes, no, I'm staying here because I just need to make sure you're okay. And that, that just kind of, I don't know, ladies, that bothers you, but it kind of bothers a guy. It's like, I'm a big boy, I can take care of myself. She said, I'm not leaving until you're done. Said, okay, okay. So I go up on the ladder, I cut off one big limb, great success, and I went to do the other one, and I, I didn't want to shut off 
the chainsaw and restart it, because that's a pain. I need to switch arms. So I just kind of leaned back on the extension ladder, changed hands, and when I did, I kind of nipped my arm just a little bit, kind of tore it up, and I, I was aggravated, because she's sitting down there, and I'm thinking, I'm going to do this job. So I just grabbed a tree and I cut off the other limb, had great success, and by then it's dripping pretty good, so I think, I better get down. So I came down, and she goes, what's wrong? I thought you had three limbs. I go, I did. She goes, well, why don't you cut the other one? I go, well, I'm just done. She goes, what's wrong? You hurt yourself. No, I'm fine, I'm fine. But, so she has to look at it, and she goes, we got to clean that up. And, I, and she goes, well, we need to get stitches. We got to clean it up. So she proceeds to take me to the kitchen and over the sink and starts pouring all this peroxide in there. And, she, and it's got all this grease in it. She goes, we need, so she gets the scrubber and starts scrubbing out my arm. At that point, I'm really getting hot. I, I said, I got to sit down. But she has no issue with blood. She's thoroughly enjoying this a lot <laughs> because she wants to watch me squirm. So I got a really cool scar. I want you to know that as a result. But the antiseptic, the cleaning, cleaning is not always easy. It's easier just to pretend it doesn't exist. We got issues, we got sin in our lives, we got problems, we got heartache, sometimes brought on by others, sometimes brought on by ourselves, and we just want to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, and we just need to go to God and be honest and confess that, God, I've got this issue, and I need your cleansing power, and he will clean us up. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world and just act like nothing's a problem, but he says, you be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We get to the point where instead of just saying, it's okay, it's fine, it doesn't matter, it's okay, it doesn't matter. just need to say, God, I need you to transform my mind and my outlook and give me a fresh new start. And he will. Well, another thing about Cavity Sam is one of them is a broken heart. Let me see if I can do another one here. Broken heart. He's kind of, oh, I don't Okay, so a broken heart is, well, it's, it's sort of buzzing, but not really. Pretend that I, didn't, I got it right. Okay, forget it. Okay, so there's a broken heart in there. He's got this broken heart. It's all pulled apart. We got broken hearts we need. The heart is broken and needs to be fixed, and you need a new heart. Now, I want you to know, in this church, we've had some incredible healings of God. We've also seen God do some healings through our incredible medical teams, the knowledge that he gives them. And so we've had transplants. We've had people with a kidney transplants and liver transplants, lung transplants. We've had a person get a new heart, a heart transplant. And it's just incredible what they're able to do. We have a broken heart. We need God's help. See, our hearts, we think their heart is good. It's the soul of who you are. But our hearts have some problems. And all of us have those places where our hearts just get messed up. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Sometimes our hearts just get so twisted and messed up. And I, we, we like to watch some Hallmark shows. If you watch a Christmas show, it seems like 90% of them comes down to this. There's some kind of a problem, an issue in life, and they give one solution always, over and over. They always say, follow your, that's it, follow your, just follow your heart. I don't know what to do, just follow your heart. What should, decision should I go? Who should I follow? Always just follow your heart. Let me tell you, that is terrible advice. It's horrible advice. Because why? Because my heart is all messed up sometimes. Sometimes my heart is being very, very selfish. Sometimes my heart is all screwed up. And he says, don't follow your heart because your heart is deceitful. And it's wrong many times. Verse 26, another promises of God. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you and I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So I'm gonna take away that old hardened heart that heart of stone, you've met people with a bitter heart, haven't you? I mean, they're just hard people. They've been through life and it shows and you just think, whoa, man, you gotta be careful when you're around them. Well, that can be true of all of us. Sin and the world has a way of just pounding and pounding and pounding in your life. We go through hard issues, hard problems, and our heart can easily become hardened toward God. Or maybe it's we've just done some pretty messed up things in our own self. And we try to cover it up enough so our heart itself becomes hardened. David had some problems in his life. 
He found in a problem, a pattern of sin. And that sin consumed him to the point where he was overwhelmed with guilt and he could choose to be bitter the rest of his life. And instead he turned to God. In Psalms 51, he has this prayer. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Would you read this prayer with me and read it sincerely? Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We need this new heart. We need God to come in and restore in this hard, bitter heart. Ask him to give you a new one. Sometimes our hearts become divided. We have this divided heart where we want to hang on to the world, we want to hang on to God, and we love God, but we also love the things of this world. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You gotta have one. You gotta love God. You find yourself divided today over what you should do. You need to pray that prayer of God, Create in me this new heart. Maybe you have this place where you just have this shallow heart. You got to the place where you love Jesus, and Jesus told a story about this parable of a sower who went in and started sowing seed, and some of it fell in this rocky soil, some of it fell in a hard path, and the ones in the hard path, it just couldn't grow its roots very deep at all. And it says, when the birds came out and ate some of those seeds, and the sun came out and scorched it, and those plants with the shallow roots didn't last very long. We go through some hard times in life. We've been through some hard times. In those hard times, some of us just get scorched up and willed away and we lose our faith because of the issues and the problems of this world and we should be growing deeper and deeper in our faith and our commitment to God. Sometimes our heart is just broken because we've been through such pain. It's grief that's overwhelmed, the loss of dreams, and people have turned in some things, and we get to that point where just, you're just broke, and you don't know how to pick yourself up. Psalms 147 is a verse that says this. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. And today, if your heart is broken, or it's hardened, or it's divided, or if it's just that place where you need some depth in your life, know that you can come to God, and he will heal your heart. Well, another one, that you'll, uh, I start to say Yosemite Sam. This is Cavity Sam over here. Cavity Sam, he's got butterflies in your heart. I'm not even going to try it because it's really hard one there. But butterflies in your, in your life, your butterflies in your stomach it is. And butterflies in your stomach, I think, thinks of the, I'm unsure about tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen. I get this fear of what's going to go. I get some doubt. Or I just feel like I don't have the strength to face what's ahead of you. You ever get that place? You just go, I don't know if I can do tomorrow. I don't know if I can do the next month ahead of me. Listen to his promise in verse 27. It says, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He says, I will give you my spirit. And he'll put that within each one of us. So he gives us a new spirit. I don't have to do it all on my own because I've got the presence of God in my life. That's when you receive Jesus as your savior, you ask for the forgiveness And then he comes in and he restores your heart. He gives you this new heart, but he also gives you his spirit, his presence in your life and gives you the strength to go on. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. If you've been trying to do it all on your own, today you just need to come and say, God, I need your strength. Many times we know this, but it's hard for us to live it out always. One more is the wishbone. And it, you know, the wishbone's in there, right? It's a big one. So the wishbone, you want to pull that out. And the wishbone is that things that we, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had this. If I had this, this would make me so happy. If I could achieve this in my life, if I just had a little more money. If I had this, if I just had this, if we think all these wishes are going to bring us fulfillment and peace, and it's going to make everything right in our lives. But it's more than just that. It's recognizing the promise of God he gives us in verse 28, where he says, you will live in the land I gave your forefathers, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. He says, I'm going to bring you back to this land, but notice what he said, I'm going to, you'll be my people, and I'll be your God. So to give them this new purpose, it's not just existing in life, it's not just going along, but this wish that they really needed was a relationship with God. So you're going to put this new purpose in their life to be the people of God and to be in relationship with him and to restore this. And God wants that for you today. 
He wants you to have this purpose, this relationship. He wants to give you this new start in your life. And this new start begins first by saying, God, I need you. And you ask for his forgiveness and cleansing. And if you're watching online, we encourage you just to put an I need Jesus in there. Let someone pray with you and encourage you. Or maybe you have this place where you just go, God, I need a new heart. Mine's been wounded, and it's bitter, and it's hard, and it's broken because life is so difficult. And you say, God, I need a new heart. And realize that he can take that divided heart, and he can get you refocused today, and he can get you pointed in the right direction. Or maybe you just need this new, new start. You need this new spirit in you. You need the strength because you're exhausted, you're worn out. You just don't know how you're going to go on. And today, just take some time to pray and say, God, would you fill me with your spirit and your presence and your focus and commit to follow him today? You say, God, I need a purpose. And help me receive that I am a child of you. And we can have this relationship that you are my God. And I need to walk with you in life. And he will give you purpose and fulfillment for your days ahead when you're walking with him. You know, Cavity Cam, or Sam over here, they take out all these problems. He's supposed to be just fine. And sometimes I go to the doctor and he can fix some ailments in my life. And I've had several surgeries and sometimes they're good. I had one surgery. They tried to do some repair work on his shoulder and came out. And some of it was successful. Some of it wasn't. And he says, you know, we could do this again. I thought, no, I don't want to go through that again. Sometimes it's successful and sometimes not. But when you turn to God, let me tell you, it works. He's one you can count on. There's, there's three things that are important to have a successful heart transplant. One is you need an accurate diagnosis. And you get your diagnosis from God and his word. We read it, it gives you the truth in life. And we need a successful surgeon to be able to do this. And the successful, successful surgeon is God and his will in your life. If you're trying to do it all on your own, it's not going to work. You need to say, God, I need you to give guidance and fix this. And then you need a donor for a successful heart transplant. And that donor is Jesus. And Jesus wants to give you a new heart and a fresh start today. God, thank you for your word, for your promises. And the promises you gave to the people in Babylon that needed hope. And Father, today we're in a place of our own Babylon where we're, we're in a different place, it's hard and we're overwhelmed and we're full of anxiety and we're uncertain about our future. And Father, I pray that you would give us clarity from your word. Forgive us when we try to fix it all ourselves and do our own self-help or we try to fix it for everybody else and think we will make it right. And God, we need you. I pray that you would give us a new heart, a new start, Father, that you shape our hearts to be more like Jesus. Those that are hardened today, I pray that you would soften us. Those that are broken, would you restore? And Father, would you heal us? And help us to see our purpose and our walking with you and fill us with your spirit and strength today. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen.